And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. This person is very slow. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Verse 8. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Verse 11. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the head ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000. And were choked in the sea. Verse 14. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. And had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. They were what? Afraid. They saw a man healed. They saw a man delivered. And their response was to be what? To be afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil. And also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with devils prayed him that he might be with him. How be it Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friend and tell them how great things the Lord had done for thee and had had compassion on thee. Verse 20. And he departed and began to publish in the capolis how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. We want to talk about the diverted destiny. The diverted destiny. The man in this story was a man that had a glorious destiny. And that glorious destiny was simple to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was, that was the purpose for which he was born. And Obviously, as he was growing up, he learned some things that will enable him to fulfill destiny. What are some things that he learned? He learned the importance of worship in getting divine attention. What was the first thing I said he learned? The importance of worship in getting divine attention. And of course, brethren, I'm sure we know Worship is not just when you sing and lift up your hands and maybe close your eyes or open one eye and close the second one. Worship is not just what we call praise and worship. Worship is in what you do. Worship is in who you are. Worship is in what you give unto God. There is no worship without sacrifice. Is somebody with me? There is no what? There is no worship without sacrifice. One of our sisters shared a testimony here yesterday that she had an illness and she was believing God and she had to go to the hospital. They gave her a date for the test and all that. And then one day she was supposed to lead prayer and she was asleep because she was tired. Until my wife called her and she woke up and she continued leading that prayer. And in the place of praying for others, I mean, she was married that you too, you need, you need prayers. At that point, she was healed. Where am I going? You see, when you pray because you are comfortable, you have a long way to go. Is somebody with me? When you begin to pray because you are what? Uncomfortable. You are about to get your results. And you get your results in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't pray because it's convenient to pray. Pray when it is what? not convenient to pray. Pray when you know that by now you should be sleeping. And that the only way you can keep yourself awake is by doing what? 
It's by doing what? No, it's not. You, you don't keep yourself awake by praying. You feel like sleeping. We're sleeping happy to stay, to stay awake. I mean, we're praying happy to stay awake. What we're happy to stay awake is making up your mind. Because if you are tired and you kneel down to pray, when by the time you open your eyes, what time will it be? Somebody is in the spirit. Maybe it is the alarm for the 5.30 a.m. prayer that will wake you up. But that time that you are tired, that you feel like sleeping, that it's as if the whole, the weight of the world is upon you, that's the time you struggle to wake up and begin to walk around in your room. Because that, me, I have prayed before standing and I was sleeping. I'm talking about myself. I was, I was standing up to pray and I was doing what? You know that I was sleep, you sleep with style. By the time you you know you are sleeping. Others may not know. But you know that that's just... They, they are not, because they are, they are busy doing their own prayer. They, they did not hear that your voice was... So, you are tired. But you want to pray. And you make up your mind to pray. God will answer you. Amen. I said God will answer you. Amen. So, this man had learned the importance of worship in getting divine attention. That's the first thing he learned. Number two, he had learned the need to talk and not to be quiet. Let somebody say something. There is an adage in God's own country that says when you keep quiet, what keeps quiet with you? Your problems will keep quiet with you. And you'll be grumbling and be blaming God. Is it God's fault? The person that God has appointed to help you may be sitting beside you. But you refuse to open up. You refuse to let that person know how he or she... In fact, the person may come to you and say, Bro, Bro Daniel, I just feel that you might need a hearing... How do you put it? A hearing ear. Is everything all right? Is there any way we can help each other? I, I, it is well. It is well. Now, he will not come and tell you that God says I should give you money or God says, because at times when you tell people like that, they will say you are arrogant. Say, who does he even think he is? He's telling me he will get a job for me. It's not your fault. Oh. It's because of uh, me. That's where I am. And then it becomes an issue. But the man has come in his humility that, brother Daniel, I think we can talk. Let's have... And then you say it is well. You refuse to open up your mouth. Somebody, God has sent someone to help you. You push the person away. I'm not saying it is not well, though. It is well with you in Jesus' name. Amen. But there is a time to talk. There is a time to do what? Talk. The Bible says, I mean, I believe it's, is it in Mark 11, verse 23 and 24, that says, if you will say unto this mountain, if you will do what? You will say, and then you believe. He said, then whatsoever you say, you say unto that mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and don't doubt in your hand. Then he said, those things that you say, you will have. It shall come to pass. Because you do what? You say it, not you think it. Tell somebody say something. say something. This man learns the importance of, I mean, talking and not keeping quiet. How did I know this? While he was there in the tomb, whenever they tormented him, what did he do? He cried. He cried. He was crying so that nobody would think that he's just a quiet madman. A quiet madman is a madman. You know, have you had people who say, say ah, and he's not a violent madman, no. The guy is mad. The day the spirit dealing with him comes upon him and you are nearby, you will know that he may not be violent, but give him a machete and you see what he will do with it. He learned the need to talk and not to keep quiet. And the third thing I want to mention, there are just three things. That he learned before he opened the door to the devil. The thought he learned is that he learned the demonstration of power. One man of God said, power is boisterous. Power is not silent. Power is not quiet. When, when, whenever there is power, you see power in manifestation. How did I know this? The Bible says they couldn't tie him. Is that not so? The time will change what happens. The chain is broken. That, is that not the same thing with uh, Brother Samson? When they thought they had gotten him, he would just stand up and continue his journey. 
that is power is not quiet. Power is noisy. Power begets manifestation. Authority is senior to power. And authority does not make noise. But authority will dictate what power does. There was a story the G.O. shared. He said they were having a convention. The church was small then. And some brethren were having, I mean, were sweating, trying to cast out a demon. And now they saw him. He said, hey, brother boy, come. Come join us. He said, no, me, I'm not going to join you. Let me pray for the brother and I'm, because I'm going somewhere. So, they said, okay, go ahead. And he just rebuked the spirit and said, get out in Jesus' name. And he continued where he was going. I said, ah, just like that. But that was his statement that did what? That set that man free. Authority. He had the authority. He spoke into the life of that young man. That young man was set free. It's not in noise making. So this man understood the demonstration of power. But somewhere along his journey, he opened the door to unclean spirits. And they began to torment him and divert his destiny. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 27. Ephesians 4.27 is a passage we all know very well. Ephesians 4.27. He said, neither give place to the devil. If you don't remember any other Bible passage, remember this one. Tell somebody, don't give place to the devil. I'm sure you've heard that statement made in different ways. Because when you give place to the devil, he takes ownership. There's like one, somebody says, they give them an inch. They take what? When you give place to the devil, he exercises authority and lordship over you. How do you give place to the devil even though you are born again? That's what I'm going to be running up. How do you give place to him? And that's in Ephesians chapter 4. Gives us a list. Beginning from verse 25. How do you give place to the devil even though you are born again? You've given your life to Christ. How can you open? This man learned the importance of worship. Learned that there are some things you don't keep quiet about. Learned the demonstration of power. Yet, he was being ruled by the kingdom of darkness. Ephesians 4.25. How do you give place to the devil? Number one, through lying. Through what? Lying. Please, ask your neighbor. Make, now, before you ask. Make sure you, everybody, if, so, if somebody is not asking, that person needs to be suspected. <laughs> so you are going to ask your neighbor, are you a liar? You, a liar? <laughs> you don't need to answer the person, no. It's just a very simple question. Because the Bible makes us understand that when we tell lies, what do we do? We give place to the devil. We give sanctified lies, blue lie, white lie, green lie. Died lie, bleached lie. Every lie is what? Lie. The Bible says without our word, all liars. All liars have no place in the kingdom of God. That's what the Bible says. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. When you talk and you have to say, hey, bro, tell me the truth. And you say, and you say, hey, no, I mean, tell me the truth. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Yeah. Number one, you give place to the devil through lying. Number two, through anger. Through what? Anger. Ephesians 4.26. It says, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. We are taught in the school of disciples that anger is what? The anointing of the devil. Anger is the anointing of the devil. Anger is destructive. Unfortunately, when you have destroyed all the things you wanted to destroy, then your eyes come and say, ah, why did I do that? Do you remember the case of Saul? Thank God he did not succeed. The Bible says Saul threw a javelin at who? At David. Then you say it's because you wanted to kill David. Who has the church throw Javelin at? Ah, 
Bible, uh, members of the Bible club. Yes, sir. Who did he throw a javelin at? He threw a javelin at his own son. The person for which purpose he wanted to kill David. So you know that all that Saul did against David was so that Jonathan would become king. Yet, because David allowed, I mean, Jonathan allowed David to go home because of the problem of Saul, Saul took a javelin and threw it at his own son. But thank God the boy, the man escaped. At the end of the day, you know when the Bible says vanity upon vanity? The man ended up dying the same day with his father. Anger. Be angry, but sin not. Be angry, but sin not. Thank God today is Mother's Day. And this is something that destroys many of our homes. Anger. Either it is the husband that is angry or the wife that is angry and one wants to be the peacemaker and the Bible says, well, you want to say, don't touch me. In fact, don't talk to me. In fact, I don't want to hear your voice at all. And some of us, foolishly, because you are currently with your wife, you move to another room. If you are here today and you are doing that, you better repent. Tell somebody you better repent. Because you are currently with your husband, you move out of your matrimonial home and go out, you have already laid the foundation for the separation of that home. It's only a matter of years. You see, one thing we don't realize is that, brethren, do you know the devil is patient? If you did not know, know it today. Satan is patient. He knows when he will be, his hands will be burnt. And what does he do? He stays away. He knows when you are on fire for God. He does what? He stays away. When he wants to come near you, he will, it's not a frontal attack. He begins to give some negative suggestions. It's for you to reject them or to act upon them. I think I shared a story with us in, in a, during the, in our Bible study. I read it in one of the books of Kenneth Hagin. Of a pastor's wife, very beautiful young woman. She was a chorister. She had a good voice. And one day she was getting ready for church. She was standing beside the mirror and she had a voice saying, you know you are beautiful and you have a wonderful voice and you are just wasting away in that your husband's church. If you were to go out and sing in a club, the whole world would know you. That first day she said, get it behind me, Satan. The next time she went before the mirror, she had a voice again. And gradually she did what? She fell for it. One day, she packed out of her husband's house and became a nightclub singer. Of course, the devil is very deceptive. When the devil gets a child of God to fall, he never allows them to rise. He will make sure he does what? He destroys that person. God will not destroy you. Amen. I say, God will not destroy you. Amen. I hope when I get to heaven, I will see you there. Please, can you ask your neighbor, say, when I get to heaven, some people are not saying because they are not sure they are going to heaven. <laughs> Say, when I get to heaven, yeah, will, I will I see you there? The third thing that can open, that can give room to the devil in our lives is stealing. Is what? Stealing. Paul was speaking to Christians who to the efficient church. Look at verse 28. He said, let him that stole steal no more. In other words, stealing in your life must be a thing of what? The past. It should not be accounted amongst us again that we are stealing. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather, let him do what? Let him labor. Working with his hands the things which is good that he may have to give him that needed. In other words, one of the reasons we walk one of the reasons that God blesses us is that we may be blessings. That you may be a blessing to others. That's why Paul made that statement in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. He said, if any will not walk, neither should what? Neither should we eat. You will not walk, don't eat. You give room to the enemy when you steal. Some of us will say, I mean, I don't steal money. 
But how is your stewardship of time? How is your what? Stewardship of time. Do you keep appointments? If we say we are meeting at 10 o'clock, what time do you come in? That one you say, okay, PJB is is church. I'm not a pastor. I'm not even a worker. I can get in any moment. What of your own quiet time? You tell the Lord, our quiet time is 5.30 every morning. No, no, maybe not 5.30. What time? Is it 5 a.m. or 6.30? <laughs> That's our quiet time. You will do the quiet time, oh, but you will, your, your appointed time is 6 o'clock. You will start at 6.45 and you do it for 15 minutes and say, God, you know I am what? I am late. Still worship of time. And once time is lost, it's gone. It's gone. Don't let the canker worm and the primer worm operate in your life. What are those? We all know Joel chapter 2, right? He said, the army I sent amongst you, the canker worm and the primer worm. What do they do? What do they eat? What do they devour? Time. Then the Bible. It is time that they devour. We don't have enough time to go on that. I know we've spoken about it for a while. But I go to the fourth point. The fourth point whereby we can I mean, give room to the devil. Corrupt communication. Corrupt communication. Ephesians 4.29 says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. In other words, when people hear you, they should say, ah, Thank God for that, brother. If you were to come into a situation that is inflamed, that is like things are about to be coming, uh, uh, to, to start burning, what is going to be your impact? Will your presence settle things down? Or will you add insult to injury? Communication. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but only that which is good to edify in, so that your words will minister grace unto the hearers. You cannot live a life of holiness if your word, or not even put it down that way, if your tongue is not controlled. If your tongue is not controlled, there is no way you can live it. And brethren, the Bible says without holiness, what will happen? No man shall see the Lord. You cannot see God if you are not holy. First Peter chapter 1, First Peter 1 chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. He said, as he which I called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. But the emphasis here is holiness in all manner of conversation. So any word that you speak that will not build holiness, don't say it. Just somebody, don't say it. Don't say it. Your hallmark, your test is against God, not against man. 1 Corinthians 15, 34 says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. Say, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. You will not be put to shame in Jesus' name. But the Bible is saying, if you don't know God, if you have no knowledge of God, you are shame waiting to happen. That's what the Bible is telling us. Number five. Things that will give place or give room to the devil. Grieving the Holy Spirit. What did I say? Verse 30 there says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. There are two things here that we need to take note of. Number one, the Bible says there is something called sin against the Holy Spirit. Matthew 12, 31 to 32. Matthew 12, 31 to 32. There is something called sin against the Holy Spirit. He said, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven you. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, the sin against the Holy Spirit is not a sin that anybody can say, oh, oh I do, I've just sinned against it. No. God is not going around looking for your fault. God is a loving Father. 
But when you get to the point where you begin to ascribe the work of God to a, to, uh, to, 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 to a, to a to the devil, you are beginning to sin against the Holy Spirit. It's as simple as that. When you ascribe the things that God is doing to the devil, that's why there are some things you don't get involved in. You don't understand, don't get involved. Many of us have opened our mouth to insult the work that God is doing and say, ah, that one is not of God, simply because we don't understand. The scripture, the word of God, is the test. Let the word of God guide you. Guide you. It's very important. Grieving the Holy Spirit. The next one is bitterness and malice. Bitterness and malice. Okay, I said there are two things in terms of grieving the Holy Spirit. I talked about the sin against the Holy Spirit. The second thing there is quieting the Holy Spirit. And quieting the Holy Spirit happens when God speaks to you or when the Holy Spirit speaks to you and you refuse to obey. You're, many of us, the place you will go that you will sin, the Holy Spirit lets you to know before you start that journey. But we refuse to listen. Then when we have done what we wanted to do, we now say, oh, Holy Spirit, I'm sorry. You yourself, you know that your being sorry is now is shallow. It's not of the heart. It's not what the Bible calls, uh, I mean, what does it call? That sorrow of the heart that brings repentance. I mean, do not quieten the Holy Spirit. Now I go to number six, I believe. Bitterness and malice. The Bible says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now the reason I said bitterness and malice, all those other things we have mentioned, but bitterness. Bitterness. You are bitter towards your brother. You are bitter towards your, your, your sister. You are bitter towards your wife. You are bitter towards your husband. Whatever it is they have done. And that will be highlighted in the, in the last point we, are going to, we, want to, we want to highlight. You must learn to forgive. Because when you don't forgive, you are harming yourself more than you are harming the person that has offended you. Unfortunately, many at times, the person we have not forgiven does not even know that we are holding anything against him or her. And that's my last point. Not showing a kindness and unforgiveness. Not showing what? Kindness and unforgiveness. Those things will open the door to the enemy. I've shared a story with us before of a man that has only one daughter. His wife died and she left him with a daughter. And so he made up his mind he would not remarry. But at whatever this lady wanted in life, he would do what? He would give it to her. So he trained her, did everything for that girl. He never for once hit that girl. Then she brought a man home one day and said, this is my husband. And he told the man, there's one thing you will do that will make me your enemy if you beat my daughter. She's the only one I have. She's the only thing I have. It was up front. And they got married. Only for this man later to hear that this his son-in-law was doing what? This one is not uh, emotional, uh, all those funny things that they talk about here. No, it's a real hard beating. He, the husband was beating the man's, ah, the man became bitter. And since the, man, the, the husband realized that he had offended this man, he began to avoid him in all ways. But because of the unforgiveness in the man, the man began to swear. Began to swear. He went to the hospital, they said, nothing is wrong with you. He went everywhere, go Ebu. Nothing is wrong with you. Until he met a man of God that said, there is somebody that has offended you that you have refused to forgive. Ah, everything came up. He said, that, 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 that. The, it all came up in him again. He said, if you don't want to die, do what? Forgive him. 
If you don't want to die, forgive him. And once he realized that he was contending with death, now it's either you forgive or you die. Early in the morning, the following day, he went to his, his son-in-law's place. You know, unlike here where you can look through, what do they call that hole? Through the pigeon and see who is outside and refuse to open the door. He knocked on the door. There's no way the boy could know that it was his father in law that was outside. He opened the door. Immediately, the moment he saw the man, what did he want to do? He was going to say, Ah, no, I'm in trouble. He was going to shut the door. The man had put his leg. So I said, No, I came for peace. I came in peace. The young man was afraid because he knew that uh, uh, at the end of the day, somebody may not leave that place alive. The man said, No, I've not come to fight you. You have offended me. But I've come to ask for your forgiveness. How many of us can do that? The moment they embrace each other, this man whose body was swollen, he had a ring in his hand, his wedding ring. He could no longer remove the ring. Uh, uh, one finger, sir. <laughs> when they embraced, it was when the wedding ring fell off that he realized that the swelling had what? Had gone down because of unforgiveness. Do you want to die? If you die in unforgiveness, you know where you are going. There is no heaven for you. It's not easy. Tell somebody it's not easy. But nobody says it's going to be easy. All of us have different things we are contending with. On this journey to eternity, brethren, if I begin to tell you what I am battling with, and we all begin to say, because some people think because pastor comes here to preach every Sunday, he has no problem. If I begin to tell you the things I'm contending, and you, and you say, ah, pastor, eh, I thank God for my life. Oh. <laughs> Just keep your own problem. I don't want to know. Every one of us have issues we are dealing with. But we serve a God who is victorious, who is, over, who is the overcomer. And heaven is the goal. So whatever it is we have to go through here, let's make sure. The Bible says in all these things, what did Job do? Very important. In all these things, Job did not sin against God. What have you gone through that you think God has offended you more than he offended Job? Because remember, Job believed that everything he was going through was from who? It was from God. God killed his children. God, 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 God. But he did not sin against God. God set his theology right. You are not Job. And I guarantee you one thing. No matter what you have gone through, you are going through. It's nothing compared to what that man went through. He did not sin against God. And he experienced a divine restoration. I pray for someone here today. Your restoration will be complete. Amen. Your restoration will be total. And your, your resurrection will be divine. Amen. God will smile on you. Amen. Your joy comet. Whatever has diverted your joy, whatever has impaired your joy or your destiny, you've got to make up your mind that I am running a race. A race that has not and will not be handed over to the devil. And victory is assured. Amen. And you will make it to this heavenly home in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe it's a good testament to this Mother's Day that you remember. I don't know what God has been talking to you about, but I'm not so bad our heads. And talk to him. In what way have you given room to the devil? In what way have you invited the devil into your business? You can make up your mind today that, ah, no, this is the end. This is the last day. From this day onwards, I turn a new leaf. I begin a new chapter. No more lying. Oh, I let go of unforgiveness. Is that anger overcoming you? Tell God, Lord, this is more than, this is beyond me. Help me. I need your help. He's going to help you. You will be surprised. You will face anger and you will say, ah, ah, is this me? Yes, it's you because God is helping you. He wants to help you. Talk to him today. Talk to him today. Talk to him today. 
What is that situation that he's talking to you about? Father, we just bless your holy name. Be glorified in Jesus' name. I commit every one of your children here into your hands. Father, let there be a divine touch. Put the devil to shame. Let our joy be full. In whatever way our destinies have been diverted, let there be a divine restoration. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We love you, Lord. For we have prayed in Jesus' name. But I venture you are in the church today. You are not born again. Second opportunity. Talk to him. Just tell him, Lord Jesus, I am yours. Come in. Take my life. Because if Christ rules your destiny, it's impossible for your destiny to be diverted. He's the one that can ensure that you run this church gloriously. Be magnified, O oh Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Is uh, Sister Grace there?